As a special witness of Jesus Christ, I testify that he lives. I also testify that the veil of death is very thin. I know by experiences too sacred to relate that those who have gone before are not strangers to the leaders of this church. To us and to you, our loved ones may be just as close as the next room, separated only by the doors of death. The more I have to do with genealogical work, the more difficulty I have with that word dead. I know of no adequate substitute. I suppose departed would suit me as well as any. I have had too many sacred experiences of the kind of which we never speak lightly to feel that the word dead describes those who have gone beyond the veil. I remind you that it's a veil, not a wall, that separates us from the spirit world. Veils can become thin, even parted. We are not left to do this work alone. And they who have preceded us in this work and our forebears there, on occasions, are very close to us. I have a testimony of this work. It is a supernal work in the Church. I am a witness that those who go beyond the veil yet live and minister here to the end that this work might be completed. When Adam and Eve willingly stepped into mortality, they knew this celestial world would contain thorns and thistles and troubles of every kind. Perhaps their most challenging realization, however, was not the hardship and danger they would endure, but the fact that they would now be distanced from God, separated from Him, with whom they had walked and talked, who had given them face-to-face -face counsel. After this conscious choice, as the record of creation says, they saw Him not, for they were shut out from His presence. Amidst all else that must have troubled them, surely this must have troubled them the most. But God knew the challenges they would face, and He certainly knew how lonely and troubled they would sometimes feel. So He watched over His mortal family constantly, heard their prayers always, and sent prophets and later apostles to teach, counsel, and guide them. But in times of special need, he sent angels, divine messengers, to bless his children, reassure them that heaven was always very close and that his help was always very near. From the beginning down through the dispensations, God has used angels as his emissaries in conveying love and concern for his children. Time in this setting does not allow even a cursory examination of the scriptures or our own Latter-day history, which are so filled with accounts of angels ministering to those on earth. But it is rich doctrine and rich history indeed. Usually such beings are not seen. Sometimes they are. But seen or unseen, they are always near. Sometimes their assignments are very grand and have significance for the whole world. Sometimes the messages are more private. Occasionally the angelic purpose is to warn, but most often it is to comfort, to provide some form of merciful attention, guidance in difficult times. But I testify that angels are still sent to help us, even as they were sent to help Adam and Eve, to help the prophets, and indeed to help the Savior of the world Himself. Matthew records in his gospel that after Satan had tempted Christ in the wilderness, angels came and ministered unto Him. Even the Son of God, a God Himself, had need for heavenly comfort during His sojourn in mortality. And so much ministrations will be to the righteous 
until the end of time. As Mormon said to his son Moroni, who would one day be an angel, has the day of miracles ceased? Or have angels ceased to appear unto the children of men? Or has he withheld the power of the Holy Ghost from them? Or will he, so long as time shall last or the earth shall stand, or there shall be one man upon the face thereof to be saved? Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for it is by faith that angels appear and minister unto men. For behold, they are subject unto Christ to minister according to the word of his command, showing themselves unto them of strong faith and a firm mind in every form of godliness. I am a witness of the condition of those who have gone beyond the veil, and we all have reason to glorify him who is our Father and him who is our Redeemer. Occasionally in the temple, the veil between us and those on the other side becomes very thin. We get additional assistance in our efforts to be saviors on Mount Zion. Never underestimate the assistance provided in temples from the other side of the veil. On another occasion, President Benson instructed us, sometimes in the peace of lovely temples, the serious problems of life find their solutions. At times, pure knowledge flows to us there under the influence of the Spirit. Said he, I am grateful to the Lord for temples. The blessings of the house of the Lord are eternal. They are the, of the highest importance to us because it is in the temples that we obtain God's greatest blessings pertaining to eternal life. Temples really are the gateways to heaven. He said, may we remember always, as we visit and work in these glorious temples, that the veil may become very thin between this world and the spirit world. I know this is true, he declared. It is well also that we keep in mind that it is all one great program on both sides of the veil, and it is not too important whether we serve here or over there, as long as we serve with all our heart, might, mind, and strength. The spirit world is not far away. Sometimes the veil become between this life and the life beyond becomes very thin. Our loved ones who have passed on are not far from us. One great spiritual leader asked, where is the spirit world? And then answered his own question, it is right here. Do spirits go beyond the boundaries of the organized earth? No, they do not. They are bought, brought forth upon this earth for the express purpose of inhabiting it to all eternity. When the spirits leave their bodies, they are in the presence of our Father and God. They are prepared then to see, hear, and understand spiritual things. If the Lord would permit it, and it was his will that it should be done, you could see the spirits that have departed from this world as plainly as you now see bodies with your natural eyes. The scripture reads, the dead who repent will be redeemed through obedience to the ordinances of the house of God. We receive the ordinances in their behalf, but they make and are held accountable for each covenant associated with each ordinance. Surely the veil is thin for us and parts completely for them in the temple. As Wilford Woodruff said, what greater calling can any man or woman have on the face of the earth than to hold in his or her hands power and authority to go forth and administer in the ordinances of salvation? You become an instrument in the hands of God in the salvation of that soul. There is nothing given to the children of men that is equal to it. He continues, The sweet whisperings of the Holy Spirit will be given to you, and the treasures of heaven the communion of angels will be added from time to time. This is worth all you or I can sacrifice during the few years we have to spend hearing the flesh." End quote. In the past two years, I've waited upon the Lord for mortal lessons to be taught me through periods of physical pain, mental anguish, and pondering. 
As I studied the scriptures during this critical period of my life, the veil was thin and answers were given to me as they were recorded in the lives of others who had gone through even more severe trials. I also learned that I would not be left alone to meet these trials and tribulations, but that guardian angels would attend me. That some, that there were some that were near angels in form of doctors, nurses, and most of all, my sweet companion, Mary. And on occasion, when the Lord so desired, I was to be comforted with visitations of heavenly hosts that brought comfort and eternal assurances and reassurances in my time of need. As we draw near to Heavenly Father, we become more holy. And as we become more holy, we will overcome disbelief and our souls will be filled with the blessed light. And as we align our lives with this supernal light, it leads us out of darkness and toward a greater light. This greater light leads to the unspeakable ministerings of the Holy Spirit and the veil between heaven and earth can become thin. The veil is very thin in the temples, especially when we join in worshiping through music. At temple dedications, I have seen more tears of joy elicited by music than by the spoken word. I have read accounts of angelic choirs joining in these hymns of praise, and I think I have experienced this on several occasions. In dedicatory sessions featuring beautiful and well-trained choirs of about 30 voices, there are times when I have heard what seem to be 10 times 30 voices praising God with a quality and intensity of feeling that can be experienced but not explained. When the Savior knows you truly want to reach up to Him, when He can feel that the greatest desire of your heart is to draw His power into your life, you will be led by the Holy Ghost to know exactly what you should do. When you spiritually stretch beyond anything you have ever done before, then His power will flow into you. And then you will understand the deep meaning of words we sing in the hymn, the Spirit of God. The Lord is extending the saint's understanding. The knowledge and power of God are expanding. The veil or the earth is beginning to burst. The gospel of Jesus Christ is filled with his power, which is available to every earnestly seeking daughter or son of God. On the outside of our temples, we place the words, holiness to the Lord. I know for myself that those words are true. The temple is a holy place where revelation comes to us easily if our hearts are open to it and we are worthy of it. I know, as I know that I stand before you, that Jesus is the Christ, that he lives, he is very close to this work and very close to all of us that are asked to perform the work throughout the earth in his name. I would like to also bear witness that in my particular case, the veil between here and the hereafter is rather thin. Pre-existence is not some remote and mysterious place. All of us are but a few years removed from the eternal presence, from him whose children we are and in whose house we dwell. All of us are separated by a thin veil only from the friends and fellow laborers with whom we served on the Lord's errand 
before our eternal spirits took up their abodes in tabernacles of clay. Because of revelations given to Joseph, the memory veil between this life and our premortal existence becomes almost transparent at times, and the veil between this life and the spirit world becomes thinner, causing family ties to become stronger and sweeter and more meaningful as the hearts of the children turn to their fathers and the hearts of the fathers turn to their children. Anyone who stands at this pulpit to deliver a message feels the strength and support of members throughout the world. I'm grateful that that same support can come from a beloved companion on the other side of the veil. Thank you, Janine. Another example of revelation is this guidance given to President Joseph F. Smith. I believe we move and have our being in the presence of heavenly messengers and of heavenly beings. We are not separated from them. We are closely related to our kindred, to our ancestors who have preceded us into the spirit world. We cannot forget them. We do not cease to love them. We always hold them in our hearts, in memory, and thus we are associated and lifted by them by ties that we cannot break. If this is the case with us in our finite condition, surrounded by our mortal weaknesses, how much more certain it is to believe that those who have been faithful, who have gone beyond, can see us better than we can see them, that they know us better than we know them. We live in their presence. They see us. They are solicitous for our welfare. They love us now more than ever, for they see the dangers that beset us. Their love for us and their desire for our well-being must be greater than that which we feel for ourselves. Relationships can be strengthened through the veil with people we know and love. That is done by our determined effort to continually do what is right. We can strengthen our relationship with the departed individual we love by recognizing that the separation is temporary, that the covenants made in the temple are eternal. For a period of 10 years, Joseph the prophet was taught by resurrected beings, by ancient prophets who returned, and angels from beyond the veil. And then 150 years ago, he was instructed by the Savior to formally organize his church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Subsequently, the prophet had other mighty visions of the Master, the resurrected Redeemer. We testify that when occasion requires, the, requires the voice of God can be heard by the Lord's Latter-day prophets, that they can tune in through the instrument of faith, and that even you and I can see beyond the veil if it is in accordance with the Lord's will, and if we are in tune with the infinite. He that watches over us shall neither slumber nor sleep. His angels are here and beyond the veil and round about us to bear us up. <laughs> 